Thanks for, to everybody who's helping out with the uh, uh, child care this morning, because I know we're going a lot of different directions with the activities today. So it's great to have you here. Th I'm glad you're here, as always. And uh, are you feeling okay? Are you feeling okay today? I ask because there's a lot of people who are getting sick right now this time of year, in February, January, February, that time of year, getting colds, getting flus. I had a couple of people in my house who are sick, getting better now. What can we do? to keep ourselves healthy, our bodies healthy, to keep bad colds away. What can we do to help, to help stay healthy? Any ideas? <laughs> Wear a mask, yeah. Yeah. Spending more time outside. Spending more time outside. Yeah. Eat good food, that's right. 
eat good food. That's excellent. Get, eat good food. Get enough sleep. That helps, too. Uh, take vitamins, maybe. I take vitamins. I don't know if they work or not. They work in my head, so I take them anyway. I haven't gotten sick, so who knows? Maybe it works. Yeah, those are all good things to do to help keep ourselves healthy, to keep, let's say, a bad cold away. But there's something else we need to keep away, too, and that's a bad attitude. A bad, we all get a bad attitude sometimes. Sometimes when we're cranky and we're angry and we're just, we, we, we just don't get along with people, we say things we regret, we do things we regret. How do we keep a bad attitude away? Keep your good attitude. Keep your good attitude. <laughs> all right. Something of a challenge there, right? Any other idea? How can we keep, our, how can we keep a bad attitude away? Yeah. Be nice to people. Excellent. Yeah. Be nice to people. Try and keep a good attitude. I think some of the things you mentioned about keeping a cold away, too, is, is good, too. Like eating right and sleeping right, because if we don't eat, we don't sleep, we get cranky, right? Keep, gets that bad attitude there. I think those are all great ideas. And the other thing to keep in mind, too, that helps keep a bad attitude away is our faith. Our faith in God. When we remember that God loves us, it can make a world of difference in keeping a bad attitude away. When we remember that we're loved, it keeps a bad attitude away. Um, that's why we come to church. That's why we worship. That's why we go to Sunday school. That's why we sing, and that's why we pray. A praying is a huge part of keeping a bad attitude away. Because if you're feeling cranky and you're angry and you're just not in a good place, and you take a second and you pray, and you remember that God's with you, and that God loves you, that bad attitude can change. That bad attitude can change. Because you remember that your bad attitude isn't uh, who you are. Who you really are is a child of God. A child of God who's loved and valued and more than what you're feeling in that moment. If you can remember that, and you can, by praying, it can change your uh, outlook. It can help push that bad attitude away, just like trying to push a bad cold away. But, but praying is a huge part of doing that. So I hope you do that. And that's one of the reasons, again, that I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here in worship, because that's another way to remember that you're loved, that you're valued, and that uh, when those bad attitudes come along, you can help push them aside, become a, uh, remember who you really are which is a loved child of God. All right? All right. Thanks for coming up. You sound great this morning, and what a morning it is. We have a lot of activities happening today, as I alluded to with the, the children's sermon uh, this morning. Directly following the postlude uh, this morning here in the sanctuary, we'll be having our winter congregational meeting. Uh, and uh, we hope you can stick around for that. If, you're, if you have... Uh, kids in the uh, Sunday school program or in the nursery, that's fine. They can, they'll stay right where they are. The Sunday school program will run uh, through uh, the, uh, uh, the winter congregational meeting. Uh, so they'll be looked after as well as uh, the nursery time. Uh, the uh, nursery care uh, folks will be in there through, through, the, uh, through the winter congregational meeting. So I uh, hope you can stick around. We'll distribute materials uh, immediately following the postlude, and we'll get right underway with that uh, meeting. And so... Uh, looking forward to that. Following, oh, and by the way, with that, the confirmation class should, uh, a reminder that they're to attend that meeting. Um, and then after the congrega congregational meeting, couldn't have missed it on your way in, the annual chili cook-off. So I uh, hope you can come to that too, because that's a whole lot of fun. Uh, and uh, the voting process is pretty self-explanatory there. So we, we, uh, it's a competition, but a, you know, competition. Uh, fun competition. Um, for that, so uh, please stick around for that as well. Now, following that, following the winter, uh, the uh, chili cook-off, there are two meetings happening. Uh, one is the confirmation class will be meeting in the youth room. We're going to be talking about the winter congregational meeting as well as uh, who we are as First Congregational Church and how we fit into the wider United Church of Christ. And also uh, in the lounge, which is right over there, will be the Lenten adult education uh, discussion class for the movie night. Uh, again, for those of you who are, maybe haven't been around for a couple of weeks here, 
during the season of Lent, uh, we're watching movies every week. A uh, different movie each week that's, uh, that's a faith-based, or we look at it at least through a faith-based lens. Uh, and uh, on Thursday night, there, Thursday nights, there's a, a viewing party at the Osterman's home. Uh, if you'd like to join them there, just let them know that you're on your way. And it's at 7 o'clock. And then on Sundays after worship, we talk about the, the film uh, and uh, just chat it up. And, and uh, we, last week we started this, and I think some great ideas came out of that discussion as a way of um, enriching our faith journey, particularly through the season of Lent. Uh, so that's happening um, for the movie Ida, which was one that they watch, we all watched uh, last, uh, this last week. And a discussion will happen for that. So, again, a lot happening after worship today. But in keeping with that pattern, this Thursday there is that Lenten movie night. It's a World War II movie called Hacksaw, Hacksaw Ridge. Um, it, and the theme we're looking at through that is the difficulty of living out our faith. Uh, so, again, uh, you can watch that on your own if you like. It's streaming services you can pick that up with. But if you'd like to come to the movie night, let the Ostermans know. Next Sunday uh, is Food Pantry Sunday, so if you're out shopping this week, want to uh, grab some food items to uh, uh, bring next Sunday, drop them off here at the church for the food pantries, and we'll see that those get delivered. And uh, confirmation class will be meeting 7 p.m. next Sunday as well. So uh, great to be part of such an active and vibrant community of faith. There's so much going on here, so many good things going on here uh, as we journey through the season of Lent. Uh, right now, uh, <clears throat> your offering is invited as we um, sing our doxology in a moment. And um, the winter congregational meeting is primarily about the budget, last year's budget, this year's budget. And uh, all of that is enriched and made possible through the giving that you folks make, we all make, to this church uh, to enrich the ministries that we have going on here uh, to make real, to make tangible uh, the ministry of Christ in this place for those who come here and those who are beyond the walls of our church as well. Your offering is invited. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. This is in the eighth chapter. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But you, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any of you wish to, become, wish to come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and lose their soul? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here ends our scripture lessons for this morning. May God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these holy words. And will you pray with me? Compassionate Creator, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and our hearts bring us into deeper relationship with you, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this story from Mark is familiar to any seminarian heading into an ordination exam. Why? Because 
it has within it that question that is at the heart of any ordination exam, and it's asked by Jesus himself. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? It's not only a good question for seminarians, it's a great question for all of us to answer as well. Who do you, who do you say that Jesus is? Who is Jesus for you? This passage from the lectionary comes halfway through the Gospel of Mark. Mark has 16 chapters. I spent some time with the calculator this week, and it turns out <laughs> that 8 is half of 16. <laughs> it's true. So if Johnny has 16 apples, and he eats 8 apples, how many apples does Johnny have left? That'd be 8. Or if, what better to say, <laughs> If uh, Brother John is reading the Gospel of Mark and reads eight chapters, how many more chapters does Brother John have to read? That's eight, too. Halfway through the Gospel of Mark. And there's a switch at this point in Mark's Gospel. The first half of Mark is all about Jesus and his disciples traveling around Galilee. After this text, the scene, the mood, changes. It switches to Jesus' journey to Jerusalem and the crucifixion that awaits him there. So this turning point in this gospel is marked by this question from Jesus, who do you say that I am? And right away, Peter's hand shoots up, right? Ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me. Yes, Peter, you are the Messiah, the Christ, and Gold star for Peter, right? He gets an A for his answer. Jesus likes his answer. We like Peter's answer. We like his answer because it's our answer, too. Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. And maybe part of the reason we like that answer is because that we, probably like Peter, thought it would be enough. Too often we think that confessing our faith, that Jesus is the Christ, the one we follow, that's all there is to it. It seems Peter thought that way too. Just say the right words. Recite the correct set of beliefs. So, when Jesus starts going on and on about how he's going to suffer and die, Peter couldn't believe his ears. This doesn't add up. That doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? And he rebukes Jesus. He rebukes Jesus, the Christ. He argues with Jesus. That alone is one of the reasons I like this passage. Peter takes on Jesus. It says a lot. It says that that's the kind of openness that Jesus had with his disciples. Jesus was not so holy, holy, holy that you couldn't disagree with him. Jesus was also, though, not so serene that he wouldn't fire back, which is what he did. Get behind me, Satan. Peter, get behind me, Satan. Not only are you not getting it, you're trying to pull me away from my destiny. You're trying to pull me away from my connection to God, and that's not going to happen, so saddle up. We're going to Jerusalem. Jerusalem? Peter and the other disciples probably looked at each other and said, Jerusalem, you mean Galilee, right? Remember Galilee? Remember the crowds in Galilee? People love you in Galilee. They love you there. Jerusalem, that's where your haters all live. You don't want to go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the worst possible place you could go. To which Jesus probably said, look, being my disciples does not mean just following me around Galilee. It also means following me to Jerusalem. Jerusalem as well. Why does Jesus want to go to Jerusalem, knowing what's going to happen there? Well, he wants to go to Jerusalem because as God incarnate, he wants, he needs to experience all of what it means to be human. And who else goes to Jerusalem? You do. I do. We all do. See, the first half of Mark, those first eight chapters, those first eight apples, that's the Galilee part. 
It's essentially the, 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 the easy kind of faith part, the studying faith part, the, the thinking about things, the singing, the worshiping kind of faith, the who is God, who is Jesus, who is Christ, what does that mean kind of faith? It's the kind of faith that we like. It's the kind of faith that we're most familiar with, right? It's the, that's the Galilee kind of faith. And there's nothing at all wrong with that kind of faith. That's where we all grow in our faith. It's where most of us encounter Jesus for the first time, is in that Galilee kind of faith. But the thing is, Jesus doesn't stay in Galilee. He also goes to Jerusalem. And he calls us to follow him there. If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny, deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it. And those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Okay then, so much for, for come unto me and I'll give you rest. Do you know why Jesus wants us to follow him to Jerusalem, this, this place where he will suffer so much pain, so much hardship? It's because he knows that you're already there. You are already there. And Jesus is wherever you are. And if it doesn't feel like you're in Jerusalem right now, the day will come when you have to go there. It's not a place that anyone wants to go. I'm not talking about the literal Jerusalem here. I hope you know that. I'm talking about what Jerusalem uh, represents in Mark. You don't choose to go to Jerusalem. You don't choose hardship and suffering in this life. But those times happen. They happen to everyone in this life. You want to stay in Galilee and you end up in Jerusalem. Maybe your primary relationship buckles. Maybe a loved one dies. Maybe you get a, a shocking diagnosis. Maybe you find yourself underwater in debt and you can't get out. You find yourself in Jerusalem. You never thought you'd end up there. This isn't what you signed up for. Things were supposed to be different. The disciples thought the same thing too. They thought they would just hang out with Jesus in Galilee. But Jesus is heading now to Jerusalem. And he wants us to follow. Lent is that time of year when we acknowledge that this life is not always easy. Tough times come. Tough times come. But Jesus is with us in those tough times. And in those tough times, Jesus says, don't lose your soul. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world but lose their soul? Don't lose your soul. No matter what happens, don't lose your soul. Don't lose your, your character. Don't lose your strength. Don't lose your courage, your integrity. When crucifixion moments enter your life, don't lose the highest of who you are. Don't lose your faith. You have a choice on how you handle things. You can behave badly, or you can behave with courage and trust. Don't lose your soul. Jesus is heading now to Jerusalem, and he wants you, you, to follow. He wants you to follow so that he can lead the way, so that he can go before you into those tragic times. He wants to arrive there ahead of you. He wants to arrive ahead of you so that he's waiting there for you when times get tough. He wants to be there waiting for you so that he can see you through, see you through to a time of resurrection and new life. Jesus is the Christ. And he goes before you in all things, especially the tough things the Jerusalem things, when it seems like there's no way out, no way forward. He goes before you to accompany you, 
and light the way to an Easter morning of new beginning, as impossible as that may seem. Let's pray. Oh, holy God, we thank you for the gift of Christ in our lives. We thank you that in him you walk before us in all that happens to us. Bless each person here in their joy. Bless each person here in their pain. Bless our church to be that place where Christ's accompaniment with us is made real. In his name we pray. Amen. Jesus takes it back.